Joining me now is Trent Mel, CEO of Electra Battery Materials. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mark. So a lot happening with your company since we last spoke. And I know recently you said, uh, I think we're around the second inning or so of our development. What part of the game are you in now? And maybe give us an overview of, uh, of, the, of the cobalt assets and what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we're maybe we're in the third inning now. Um, <laughs> and so but the vision of Electra is refining. So we're one step removed from mining, which was probably the, the mainstay of this channel. Um, but for, for us, we, we need to take that those minerals and process them into a form that can be used in electric vehicle batteries. And so we're known primarily for the work on cobalt and building out our cobalt refinery. More recently, we started working on refining of battery materials, so the recycling end. But then beyond that, we've got longer term plans with our downstream partners, OEMs and battery makers to look at nickel and manganese. And so the cobalt plant is well advanced. The recycling demonstration plant is well advanced, but we still got to get the first cash flow, and that's really the focus of the team right now. Now, in terms of uh, battery makers, that leads us directly to LG Energy Solutions, the largest EV battery maker outside of China. Uh, you extended your deal three to five years. You're going to deliver more product uh, over the course of that. So um, can you flesh out the details there and also the significance to Electra? Yeah, and, and, you, and you, you said it, Mark, the biggest battery maker outside of China. Um, and of note, if you look at LG and how they're investing ex Asia, they're building a, a battery plant in Poland, one in Europe for all of Europe. They're building seven in North America. And so you can see where their priority is. And so, as the only prospective cobalt refiner on the continent, and we'll be producing soon enough, you know, they're trying to lock down their supply chain. And there's a lot that has to happen, right? We get all the attention on the battery plants that are being built and the assembly plants, but you still need a above stream from that. You need to go up stream to cathode and then precursor and then this refinery. And so as they put the places, pieces together, they kind of wanted to get their foot on this supply because it shores up their needs across North America. So they've been a, a fabulous partner. I can't say enough about them. And, and I see more things we can do with them in the future. And uh, you've said, I believe the number is about, that accounts for about 60% of your future production. And that you're, you're also in talks with at least one other so-called household name uh, in, in, in the sector. Do you want to break any news for us right now? Sure. <laughs> well, elect, uh, in fact, LG will take up to 80% now. 80%, okay. And, and so, it, yeah, 60% was the initial deal. We've extended that to 80% in five years instead of 60% in three years. So, again, they, they're kind of doubling down on their commitment. Um, and I will say it's created a little bit of competition for the remaining 20%. We've got two OEMs in particular that we're, that we're close to. Um, but my, my view, why... Why give away the supply without an investment? So I think we can afford to be patient thanks to the relationship we've got with LG. Interesting. Now, uh, you, you've said that roughly half of the re CapEx requirements for the refinery have been incurred so far. Yeah. Uh, and I know you did a, a raise recently. Well, what's your cash position? And would you say that there there is usually and often and always healthy investor demand to fund the project? Yeah, the um, the cash position, because we're in a bit of a blackout, I can't give you the latest, but you know we, we were sitting just north of 20 million um, at the last quarter once I account for the, the most recent financing. Um, when you look at the cobalt asset, I probably got to change the narrative, because yes, we spent half of our capex, but that's an existing, existing asset that has a replacement value north of $100 million. It's, an, it's a refinery that's permitted, it's got hydroelectric power, it's got water and roads. And then we've got, you know, the last estimate going back 15 years was 80 some million US dollars replacement of, of just the infrastructure, you know, building and equipment. And so, you know, all said and done when it's built, it's probably a $250 million replacement value. We still have that 250 need to invest about 80 million Canadian, 60 US. And so that's, that's the piece that we're working on. So we have done some equity raises. I think the path that I see for that remaining 60 US is going to be largely, I'll call it non diluta financing. So think partners, think government, um, and maybe I won't say more, but um, give me, it take a few months, uh, maybe, maybe Q2 of next year is the goal I've set for myself to have that funding package for the cobalt plant in place so that we can complete the project. Okay, Trent, so uh, as you're constructing and building out the refinery, you, you uh, are recycling as part of a, a demonstration yeah. project, basically 40 tons of so-called black mass, uh, essentially waste material from batteries, and you've already shipped about half of that. So tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, and that's, that's exciting, because this is made in Canada intellectual property. Um, so, so using that legacy refinery that I described earlier, 
we've got all the equipment. It stopped operating in 2015, so we've recommissioned everything, replaced a couple of pumps and motors. But if you walk through there now, the plant is humming, and we're running through black mass that we've acquired in the market. And, and why that matters is when you look south of the border, some of the big recycling names that we've heard of, um, and that we know of, are all they're, all they're doing, what they're doing at this point is they're shredding the batteries. So they're taking in battery scrap or spent batteries, they're crushing it, removing the plastics and the foils, and then they make this black powder that we call black mass, which has six critical minerals in it, and then, and then it gets sold off to Asia, off to Glencore. So we're in that second step. We're the first company on the continent doing a plant size demonstration of how you take that black mass and extract the nickel, cobalt, and lithium. Small scale, but we've got proof of concept. We keep working on the process, uh, and, and we've, we've made a lot of progress on what is really the second stage of our growth. It could become the first stage because we're already producing. There's a, there's a view that maybe we commercialize that on a small scale before we complete the cobalt plant, but I'd say stay tuned. There's a bit of a, a technology and funding race to see which one will actually get across the line first. So as part of this trial, you're enhancing your process. And what can you tell us about the improvements you've seen in recovery rates and metal content and impurity levels? Yeah, that, that's been the beauty of running this demo plant for nine months. It's one thing to do it in a lab, which we did, which we all do, right? You do these pilot size. But once you do things in a, in a large scale, uncontrolled environment, you learn things. You know, what's your leach time, your residence time? Can you play with reagents? And we got a world-class lab right there. So we're able to test all the product streams in real time and make adjustments. So over nine months, the quality of our production, of our product has gone up, in some cases exceeding what we were seeing in the lab, but certainly exceeding what we saw in first production back in, back in January, 2023. Um, and, and we're looking to extend that supply chain, right? Because what we're doing, we're taking in black mass and we're making the big payables are the nickel, cobalt, and the lithium products. Um, but I think we can further beneficiate them because we're not yet at a point where they're of a battery grade quality. And so we've got a couple of partners that we're talking to to extend that part of the value chain, um, which is not yet in the, in the public domain. And then on the front end, this is known, we're working with an indigenous group called Three Fires to capture that battery shredding piece so that we're not buying black mass, we're actually getting the battery scrap from the cell makers we're making our own black mass and feeding it to the refinery. And so in addition to perfecting the box that we're working in, if we can extend that value chain, the margins just get that much better. On another front, uh, you've talked about the you know, the fact that you're exploring a second refinery in uh, Bekankura, which we know is a, such a hotbed for critical minerals and, and EV batteries. And you've discussed the possibility of a, perhaps a 10-year deal of some sort. Uh, also, um, the fact that uh, governments could uh, cover a lot of the capex and that production may happen sometime in 26. So can yeah. you take us through that? Yeah, so the, the opportunity in, in Bay Concours, Quebec, uh, is that we've got three world-class companies building cathode manufacturing facilities. You've got GM working with POSCO, their Korean partner. You've got BASF, and more recently Ford uh, announced with their Korean partner EcoPro that they'd be building their own cam plant. We know that Valley is there building a, a nickel plant to support uh, the activities in, in the Bay Concours area, which is just just north of Montreal. Uh, and I look, I got a call from a government official a year and a half ago, and they said, look, we need a cobalt refinery here. Uh, we've got a foreign company that would do it. We'd rather be Canadian. And so the you know, the beauty of investing in Quebec is they've got the tools, they've got the levers, and they can nudge their federal counterparts to match. And so we've got a letter of intent. Um, I don't think I can just close the funding mechanism, but it'll be less than half the capex but a heck of a lot more than 25% of the CapEx. So somewhere in that ballpark, um, it really lowers the hurdle rate for what you want to do. And because you've got three downstream clients, um, this is one that, um, sh well, as a second plant should be easier to build. I think we can do a nickel dissolution plant, so a smaller footprint, less complex, less capital intensive asset to get that into production. But before we go there, let's get Ontario built up and running and, and we'll use those cash flows to help us grow. Right, now you can't give the numbers, but I, I seem to remember I heard 30 to 50 percent perhaps could be covered by, by governments. Yeah, now, yeah. Uh, you've still got this um, cobalt asset in Idaho. Yeah. You still like it, but you've also referred to it jokingly as a redheaded yeah. stepchild, uh, only because you, you don't really have the time or resources to devote to it right now. So uh, where are you there in terms of maybe finding a partner or spinning it out? Yeah, we, I mean, where we are now, we were, we were a little bit early to this North American onshoring. Right? We've been doing this for a few years now. and. It started with resource exploration, which started in Ontario, brought us to Idaho. We love Idaho because it's primary high-grade underground mining opportunities. Um, as the commodity as it does, right? You go through your cycles. 
as it went through a trough in 2018-19, started looking at refining, and we're waiting for cobalt to pick up. Uh, there'll be a few more quarters, I think, uh, before we decide how to realize some value there. But you know, we've got in our Iron Creek project a high-grade underground copper cobalt asset. Uh, we believe we found a satellite extension, a fault offset deposit that, that merits some drilling. Um, and, and the real, the live question for us is, um, how do you realize value? We're not going to sell it for a song. The holding costs are low. But the best use of our dollars right now is getting that refinery of ours up into a cash flow status. So I do love it. Um, and, and, and with where we are now in the supply chain, there's a lot more engagement between government and companies like ours. So it's not just the Canadian government. It's arms of the U.S. government, whether it be DOE or state or DOD. Take your pick. We, there, there's great collaboration and there's great interest in Idaho because it's North America's best chance at a domestic supply of cobalt. And so I don't have a near-term answer other than I love it. And um, as the market for cobalt recovers, there'll probably be more opportunities to create some value there. All right, Trent. So to, to wrap things up, to summarize, a lot going on, a lot of moving parts. Uh, where does Electra fit into to this green energy shift? And, and give us your, your best 30, 45-second pitch, if you could. Well, we're going to be the greenest cobalt producer on the planet, hands down. That's, that's easy. Um, We've, we've got a great set of relationships in the downstream, not just with LG, but a few OEMs that we're working with right now. We'll be the first and only producer of cobalt uh, in the North American marketplace for the EV supply chain. And from that, we'll be able to lever into better recycling, a second plant in Quebec, and some growth opportunities in the state of Idaho. There you go. Great right. to catch up with you, Trent. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Trent Mal, CEO of Electra Battery Materials.